Good evening. Uh, today, this conversation, this interview is going to be in English since I have a very special guest, a master of many things. He was an escapologist. Some of you probably don't even know what that is, but he was like Houdini, Houdini. Huh? And now he's doing a stand up, per perfect stand up career. He's a musician as well. Uh, today, with me, Gary Michaels. Hello, Gary. How are you doing? Thanks for having me on. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, I, I guess you're quite busy with your YouTube channel, Let's Talk Comedy. Let's Talk Comedy, yes. YouTube channel aimed at new comedians. And um, this, yeah, it's been lovely to set that up. And to see people actually interested in watching the videos is also a plus. So, yeah. Um, you started uh, this YouTube channel uh, during the Corona lockdown. How come you decided to do it now? Yeah, um, it wasn't really something I was thinking about doing. I was running a lot of uh, comedy gigs in London. Uh, now, I'm from Ireland, as you can probably tell by my accent, and I moved over to London in 2015, started setting up the comedy gigs in about, I think, I think it was about 2019, so not too long. And then the lockdown happened, and I needed something that was connected to the comedians that I got to know. I just wanted to have, be able to still create something um, to keep my foot in the comedy game a little bit. And I thought of the comedy you know, tutorial channel because most of the gigs I was running were open mic gigs and people starting out. And I also did a few workshops before lockdown came in. So once lockdown started, I was like, I'll give it a go. I'll make a tutorial channel. And if people like the kind of style in which I communicate and the kind of points I think are important that people helped them along the beginning of the career well then great and so i shared it to my comedians group on facebook and then it just took off from there and since people wanted to see the to see the videos i just kept making them and so very quickly i wrote out 100 episodes and i'm halfway through making all them so really it was something to keep myself busy stay in the comedy game as well as you know study the you know how to present the ideas i knew about comedy so like if i thought something worked well on stage i find it very interesting in writing out why it works back to the basics and so by me even teaching it on the channel is i'm remembering it for myself too so it's also helping me stay sharp so that when the stages do open up again i'll be able to well perform pretty much where i left off so it was in that's an interesting side note to why i did it as well so many reasons there but ultimately to keep myself sane and to stay as busy as possible because it went from being so busy to the next day Mar march 16th the week of march 16th i think i ran six or seven gigs that week and in the following week i had nothing <laughs> all the venues shut so it was from craziness to absolutely nothing and then i was like okay i need something to do and Another reason I did it was because people ask me sometimes what my favorite thing about being a performer is. And it's always been the same question, no matter what I am performing, if it's music or comedy or whatever it may be, it's always sitting down with other performers and talking about what we do, talking shop, talking the theory about it, how can we make it better, talking about writing, talking about how can we earn more, how can we progress, all those questions I love to talk about. and. So I decided, well, since I love to talk about it, I'll just talk to the camera and see if other people want to hear what I have to say. So it's it's also it's very enjoyable for me to dig into the theory. I find that more maybe even more fun than actually the performing itself is to dig into the theory and why what works and why does it work? All those things are interesting to me. Have you had the chance or uh, okay, let's we have to mention that you were in a band in your teens and late teens and you were a street performer you're <clears throat> of, uh, of multiple talents but uh, now that you're just have you ever read any books on uh, comedy theory perhaps actually no i haven't um i i have not studied it in a way to sit down and and read up on i don't think i've I read a few books on people like successful comedians lives and stuff. I read a few of that. Um, 
but they wouldn't be teaching. I've learned how to perform. Like 80% of my work has been street performing, as you mentioned. And really, I learned from other performers who would be traveling around. And so if I was fortunate enough to have a performer come to Dublin and then go out drinking with them, and certainly when I was younger, like in my early 20s, I was doing a lot wrong. And although I had a small show, it, it needed a lot of work. And so I was fortunate enough to have a lot of performers coming who were way more experienced than me and told me all different small changes I can make. So all my my learning has come from listening to people who well, we're doing it differently and then trying out what they said. And if something worked, I kept it. And if something didn't work for me, I, I well, threw it away. And I've always tried, I've always tried to listen to what other people tell me uh, about um, changing it up and making it better. And I think people can help you out, even if they're not more experienced than you. I think everyone has something to say about someone else's performance. And sometimes even if someone... I find sometimes people saying things about my own performance and they're only, they are, might only have a year or two experience of being a performer and they're telling me something that actually makes a lot of sense to me and I should go down the way. So it's not always about them being more experienced than me. But uh, yeah, so in a nutshell, to answer the question, it all my learning has come from listening to others. And in the music, it came from just locking myself in a room with a guitar or a bass and hours and hours a day for multiple days and yeah now of course today everything is different you can just look online and see countless amounts of um people who really know what they're talking about uh tell you exactly what <laughs> all you need to know but uh yeah so like 20 years ago it was different yeah uh d definitely definitely i'm i'm I don't know how old you actually are but i mean my uh, late 30s oh, yeah and uh Why? we started before before the internet as well with uh, some musicians we had a group and everything but uh this uh question about uh, listening to advice uh have you ever noticed that you were not mature enough to understand the advice that you were given and uh do you have a system for, for instance, for writing some advice down so you can look at it uh, in a couple of months or in a couple of years when you're mature enough to understand it? I wouldn't have put you at your late 30s. <laughs> I didn't think yeah. I thought you were going to be younger. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's the I first know. point. I thought you were going, yeah, I'm 35. Um, uh, yeah, that's a great question. That's a really great question. And have I given it much thought? I don't know. I suppose it's it's a tough one to answer because, I mean, one thing performers do, regardless of what they perform, they all like to give advice, as you know. They all like to give other people advice all the time about what, you know, what works, who's who's good and who's absolutely terrible. And I think, if I'm honest, I think some of the things that I might have disagreed with or I might have not given a chance i simply just forgot about um but i and and i suppose there was a lot more that i forgot about because i found when something when someone told me something that made sense to me i kind of could imagine it working immediately like if, when someone said something i was like oh that's really interesting i never thought about it that way and then i was like i was so excited to go and try it and so there wasn't much information people told me that I thought, oh, that might not work. And then I tried it and it did work. Usually I made my mind up right there on the spot and we could either dissect it over a conversation and get to the root of what I was going to try out or a different way of doing something. Um, you know, but one, one thing I, I wish I had listened to and it was what people told me the most at the beginning. And I think it's true for nearly everybody and it's to slow down slow down in your performance because i was chaotic and i was like you know on street performing and i i just when i started street performing when i was able to get a show when i got over the fear of just presenting myself on the street when i got over that i was just too fast speaking way too fast screaming too loud thinking i needed to be more energetic 
than anyone can imagine in order to get a crowd, when really that's not the case at all. Uh, people like to respond to someone who's a little bit more relaxed and comfortable in their own skin rather than just running around crazy. So I suppose that was the that took me a long time to look at myself and realize I, I really got to slow this down. And now I see that in a lot of other people. And, and even if and even now today, I, I, I think like if if I get if I get uh, energetic on stage and if I very excited about my performance or something and it's it's a good show, I find if it starts to go very well, I start to speed up. But if I start to speed up, I start to lose them a little bit. So I need to even today, I need to watch that one because naturally I do speak very, very fast. And uh, certainly that was a problem at the beginning of the YouTube as well. I was making stand up tutorial videos and I would look back at the footage and I'm talking like this all the time and I can't even and can't understand anything I'm saying. So I had to kind of, all right, I'll remake that video. But uh, yeah, writing writing it down, it, it would be certainly something I would recommend. So, like if you're having a if you're having a session with another, you know, comedian or whatever it is that you're interested in performing and you're talking, definitely you should be writing writing your ideas down. Did I do it? No. Did I wish I did it? Absolutely, because um, sometimes after a couple of pints, some great ideas are flying around, along with terrible ideas, but some great ideas are flying around that but no doubt would have benefited me if I was able to look back at them. So certainly something I'll try and do for next time. <laughs> great, great. Um, did you look up to any of the greats uh, who were street performers or uh, theater performers that uh, crossed over into stand-up? Of course, here I mean uh, Steve Martin and Eddie Izzard the gods of comedy. Huh? Uh, did you look yeah. up to them in your beginnings or did you say, I'm going to do my own thing. I know who I am. I'm just going to go on stage and do it. Like I feel I should. Um, yeah. I mean, like I was those particular comedians you mentioned, like uh, Steve Martin. Yeah. I mean, I'm a big fan of both. And as he, Eddie Izzard um, started on, well, for a period of time, he was a performer in Covent Garden, which is where I perform it here in London. And um, yeah, I, I did in a way, I admired, I always admired any amount of success that people were able to gain, especially coming from street, because it's very difficult to become a street performer and, and leave. I think it's very difficult to leave any section of performance that has been good to you in any amount like if, if it earned you enough money so that you can fund yourself year in year out it's very difficult to just move on to something else and leave that so i've always admired you know successful musicians it's the same thing it's it's just a hard game to make it to make a proper living out of it and actually fund yourself and fund your family and you know live in the way that you want to live it's very difficult so i admired the success in the work um, in terms of actual performance, there were a few performers I admired in the street. Um, and there's one in particular called Dave McSavage, who I would have grown up in the street watching. He was a comedian with a guitarist. Absolutely incredible. Still today, maybe the best I've ever seen. And then, of course, I admired a, a few great shows that would come to town that later on became my friends. And then I was in the same circle. So it was more of an admiration of... Um, I admired their ability to gain the biggest crowds and make the most money and put up, perform the best shows. And it was an incentive for me to work really hard so that I could stand alongside them, so that I could be welcomed into the group. It made me work hard. I was like, well, I want to, I also want to have the biggest show in town. And it was, it was exciting to go down that road. So maybe, so admiring is the right word, but for possibly the different reasons than not necessarily enjoying the material as an entertainment point of view but more enjoying how they engage with the crowd and the success they were able to gain is is admirable although i'm not on the same path for searching out that success but again anyone who can find any type of success as a in doing whatever they want to do has always been that's always been amazing to see for me great great uh, I myself have no experience in uh, uh, street performing, but uh, I guess you you want to catch the attention of the audience that are doing their normal stuff that day. And here in stand up, actually, you have the luxury of having the attention, and you have to say something 
but do you have to play to the audience or do you perform now what you want to say? Or do you still have that, like, I guess it's the mentality of street performers to, to catch them in a net and entertain them and be very quick with the jokes and with the action and with gesticulation and everything. Um, so do you still use this street performer, I guess, this street performer mindset, or do you do it now, like, okay, I have your attention, I'm going to tell you something that I think about the world right now? Yeah. Oh, these are burning questions. I'm enjoying this. This is looking into my soul. Um, yeah, I think that, that is that is a huge difference. It took me a while to... Now, I've always performed stage alongside street. Not as much stage, but I've I've always performed in there. But what I was performing was, you know, variety, like, like, like escape shows, like a straight jacket escape or a knife juggling on like a burlesque show or a cabaret show or something. And I thought that moving into comedy, stand-up comedy, it was going to be very similar. I thought it was going to be the same. I thought that, well, I just go on stage and tell jokes. And it's it's so different. I, I was I was shocked by when you're doing a setup for a joke, like you're telling them a piece of information, and then you're going to give the punchline. So you're telling them information, but the silence in the room when they're listening is like nothing else. There's no other type of silence when people are actually listening to what you're saying because in the comedy it's, it's like yes they're there to laugh but they're there to laugh if you're funny at other nights it's they like at a burlesque night or a cabaret night or even on the street if people kind of stop that's them saying i'm going to be into what you're doing you've already made me stop that's a huge thing when someone stops to watch your show on the street because you know, they, they've told you that they're open to hearing what you have to say. With a c comedy, the audience, it's kind of like you have to prove they will listen, but you really have to prove that in the first few seconds of your show that you can make them laugh. On the street, you don't need to do that. You can you could just play out big props and play music. Now, I chose not to. I chose to talk. But even in the talking, you don't have to make them laugh. It's plus if you do, it's a great thing to make them laugh at the beginning. But you can just be interesting. You can just be moving props around. You can be telling them what's about to happen. You can be telling them what you're going to do. Or you can be talking to people as they're walking by. Anything that just puts interest on you. And people will wait for a period of time for a bigger crowd to build. And even the crowd building within itself can be interesting to people watch as they stop. And they look around and go, oh, now there's more people here. Oh, this is going to be better. And you do small tricks and you build it up. But a comedy... Stand up, you only have to do one thing, make them laugh. So you better get to it as quick as possible. So that was the that was a difference mindset I had to get going on. So I very quickly found out that the only thing I take from street performing that I bring onto a stand-up comedy stage is probably the confidence and I and and the perception as well. I can I can read a room pretty quick knowing what it needs, but the hard part is well, being able to deliver exactly what it needs at the moment. Like, do the audience need to be brought down a little bit? Do they need to be brought up? And so, yeah, I, I go on then. I try and leave as much of what I learned on the street behind. And I would have a lot more punchlines if I was on stage doing stand-up. Or if I was on stage emceeing a show, I'd have a lot more punchlines. I would get them laughing a lot quicker. And then I would use, I would use uh, ways of letting them know who I am at the beginning of the set as quick as possible. And what I always say to anyone starting out is to be likable as quick as possible. Because yet again on the street, because and in other venues, you can do an interesting thing. And although it's nice when they like you, they don't have to like you straight away. You can win them over, over a longer period of time. Whether in stand-up, I think the important thing to do as soon as you walk onto the stage is to figure out how to get them to like what you're about, how to get them to like your presence on stage, the way you communicate, the way you talk into the mic, give them a few moments just to listen to your voice. All of those things I started to learn. This is really important here. I need to get to this, you know, because once they like you, they'll laugh at your jokes. You, if your jokes are good enough, once they like you, at least they'll be open to listening to your jokes and then if they laugh, they laugh. So yeah, I, I try and leave as much uh, theory I've learned for, on the street just for the street 
because it's such a different ball game. And I'm not going to say it's harder because I don't think it is. Um, but it's it's just so different. Um, yeah. Well, uh, I I can't ima imagine still now after a couple of years in stand up of doing a street performance. Uh, I had a couple of friends who are st street performers, and whew, it's it's a different beast, I guess. Uh, did your stand up experience influence your street performance as well, perhaps? Um. Yes. Yes, it did. Um, I always. I was always a speaker. I always want in whatever show I did, obviously not with the music. I was a bass player for for quite a long time, 11 years and stuff. But when I when I I mean I started the street performing in a way to fund the band. So I wanted to earn money for the band. And also it was handy because when the band went on tour, I didn't have anything keeping me. I could just leave and bring my show with me and perform in other cities as well. But yeah, the the, the stand-up did make me uh, better i suppose maybe not funnier because that was just that's just progressing as it's progressing you know in a in a natural way but what it did do is i think it made me speak to the audience in a better way i think it made it made me uh, gain the ability to focus the audience more on when i just had the microphone whether before i did stand up for a while it was a little chaotic it was a little the energy was a lot higher and when i was talking i was always holding a prop or holding something and the jokes i was telling although it's nice when they have a laughter they weren't as important if they didn't get a laugh it doesn't matter because what i'm about to do this juggle thing or i'm about to do a magic trick or i'm about to do something and that was always the focus whether when i went to stand up I was able to gain the ability as having the joke be the focus for a brief period of time. And when I get a couple of laughs with that, then move on to the trick that I'm, that I'm presenting. So it was, it was, it was the show could be broken down into sec sections. And I got more confident in my ability to tell jokes in front, uh, you know, in stand up. A little bit, like not, not hugely, because I think the confidence mainly did come from, from the street performance, which I started way before stand up. But but it definitely helped, and it was obviously great to gain the experience of performing in different stages, which I'm always telling people to do. To you know, tell comedians not just to perform at comedy clubs, but to to seek out as many different performances that they can, and as many different styles of shows, especially for an audience that don't go out to see comedy, because everyone enjoys a laugh. And if you're there at a conference or at a cabaret night or whatever it is, and you're the comedian on stage, that's that's great for you because people might not be conditioned to be to see comedians, and you go up there with a fresh audience who haven't seen comedians on that on in that night, rather than going to a comedy club where there's twelve comedians. Or here in London at open mic, the average I think is seventeen or eighteen comedians, which is just crazy. But yeah. Okay, uh, th that's uh, quite a, a high number. Uh, so, uh, are the uh, audience are they interchanging or are they not tired or does the comedian every com comedian gets two minutes or how is it done in London? I don't actually know that. Um, now my my gigs don't have that many. I I have about eleven or twelve comics on in the night, so I do like six in the break and then six more. But some of them, yeah, there's there's sometimes there's some nights here have rules. There's what's called a bringer night, and that's where a comedian has to bring a friend with them, one or more friends with them, in order to get on stage and perform. So that's kind of, that's a little unfair. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I've seen people turned away because they don't have a friend with them. And I don't I don't really understand that. So, so when you say audience, it's really just comedians and their friends. And they, they have five minutes on stage. Which is the average here for five minutes on stage, and so a night might go three, three hours, fifteen minutes. Maybe I've, I've, I've seen a night go three and a half hours before, and so people are just like, oh, come on, like with with two breaks or yeah, two intervals, and it's um, yeah, it's it's it can be brutal. That's not all the night. Just some nights are like that, but um, London is very different for the open mic than the rest of the country. The rest of the country don't have rules um 
and they wouldn't have that many acts on. And outside London, the comedy nights would be nicer, nicer to attend. I think I'm not saying necessarily better, but nicer, nicer to attend. Because I think better is a strange word when it comes to a gig. But yeah, London is a crazy. London is a crazy place for uh, for comedy. I think there's. I'm gonna say when before lockdown there might have been if you include all the open mic comedy nights like the well-run ones and the badly run ones i think there might be 300 close to anyway because it seems that every pub has some night that has comedy on it's quite crazy and so there's just a, just always people starting at the at the at the beginning and so these some 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 pubs can afford to put loads of rules on because people are, just, are going to follow them. And the nights that have the rules, some of them are very, very good. It doesn't make for a bad night. It's just that, in my opinion, it's just too long. But, but you know, they're, they're well run and they're well emceed and stuff, but I just don't think people should be made sit in the room for three hours to watch 20 comedians go up and talk about how their day went. <laughs> yeah. Um, even you, you yourself had a couple of uh, nights uh, before the lockdown. Uh, and how is it to run more than one show per night? Uh, I know it, as an MC, you do the crowd uh, motivating and you can just do the comedians like, oh, here's the next comedian. Or you can do some material as well. Uh, how did you do that when you had multiple performances in one night? Um, yeah, it was tough. At one stage, uh, the, the craziest it got, I believe, was, I'm going to say, November of 2019. Yeah, 2020, yeah, 2020, yeah, November of 20. It's tough to know what timeline is with this lockdown. But uh, November of 2019, I was running 10 nights a week. And so I usually I didn't do two gigs on one night because... Usually I got someone in to another comedian because I had some nights set up that, you know, new comedians can just MC if they wanted just to gain the experience. And so I, I, I kind of set that up for comedians. So that, so that was a, that was a happening a little bit, but nearly every night I was MCing and I really liked MCing. I think MCing was, I think MCing is a natural middle ground between street performing and between stand-up comedy because I've, I found that another a friend of mine once told me a very interesting thing where he said he says street performers like to MC because it's we we bring up the next act like we're presenting a trick so if I was going to juggle fire I put as much into telling the audience that I'm going to juggle this fire to get them interested that well then you just put the next act in position of the fire. So you communicate it in a way that you're happy that this person's going to come to the stage. And if you learn how to do that correctly on the street and then get a really good reaction over what you're saying and get the crowd going well, well, that's why I think a lot of street performers tend to make, not all of them, but tend to make very good MCs. And I think MCing is, is one of the most fun performance styles I, I I've had I've had a lot of fun emceeing it certainly when you know yes I just I, I find um I find I can I found sometimes stand-up comedy is a little I don't I don't like having to go into my material and just stick through it the whole way through I like to be a little bit freer than that and maybe improvise is the wrong word but kind of We'll kind of chat to the audience and see where it goes. And the reason I say improvise is the wrong word, because I, I do have it backed up and writing, and I am going to get to a particular point. But how I get to the point, as long as I get to it, I don't really mind. I like to kind of stumble across what I've prepared. And that way it kind of has that kind of, has the illusion of chaos, has the illusion of I'm just figuring something out. And then when it hits, it hits really well because, well, it appears that I'm just chatting to the audience and opening up dialogue back and forth. And I've, I've had a lot of fun doing that. <clears throat> Great. Uh, another question. In uh, 2017, you had your uh, Edinburgh Fringe show. 
a 50 minute show how can you you can swear on this channel how the fuck can you manage to put up 50 minutes with five minutes of open mics and perhaps 15 minutes if you're emceeing or whatever how do you manage to put 50 minutes together okay our friend gary michaels just froze so we'll continue after this short break okay uh so now we continue with gary michaels oh, I, how I, do lost you you. Put... I lost you i lost you oh how the fuck do you get yeah, 50 minutes for your 2017 <laughs> edinburgh show if you only can manage five minutes on open mics how do you manage such a big chunk of time um well, I mean, I had been an average show for me at that time. An average show for me for the last ten years will be about forty, forty-five minutes. That's how long I do on the street. And you know, in the summer, I might go an hour on the street for for one street show. I might an hour is pushing it, but like fifty, fifty-five minutes, I might do on the street alone with one show and like stop a crowd of maybe a hundred and fifty people and keep it for the entire time. So the the length. Being able to perform for that long, I had the experience for many, many years uh, for Edinburgh. The thing that Edinburgh is tough is you really not knowing what room you're going to be performing in. Like you just see it for the first time when you get there. And that's the, major that's, that's the case for the majority of people, I think. They, they, they see the venue for the first time on the first day of Edinburgh. And then you have to work around that. So, and, and my venue was... A cupboard. It was like it was. It was pretty terrible. It was. There was no microphone. There was. It was. It was as bad. There was a sink in the room, and there was just uncomfortable chairs, and it was. It was not very nice. And so I had to. So it was perfect. So it was very. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was. Well, it was perfect for my first Edinburgh experience because everyone goes through that. Everyone has that experience of being in some awful place and i mean the location was good so that was nice like there was there was quite a few people like there was good foot traffic good flow going on outside so i could i could you know advertise the show well the attendance was was okay but in terms of creating a show i did at that time i did um a comedy music show so i was playing an acoustic guitar and singing a few comedy songs now i've been playing guitar for since I was 13 and I've played a lot of guitar. I like do the I do the shred guitar and I'm quite I'm quite good at a few of the solos and stuff. And so if I felt that uh the if I felt that the energy that I needed a little bit of time to regroup, I could do something impressive on the guitar and talk over it. And I found, you know, that along with a few of the tricks in the room was able to kind of win back the audience because of how bad the room was or perhaps because of you know the show i did i'm not going to say it was one of my better shows because as a comedian yes it was my first time to write an hour-long show but as a performer i've had much many many experience of performing not long before so if the comedy i was writing dipped a little bit and it wasn't hitting the crowd like i wanted it to well i i could go back and rely on my performance and maybe maybe stop being the comedian and be more the performer and play around with the space and inter and open up dialogue with the with the people in the room and kind of forget about the comedy for a bit because I have a learnt off I can go back to it whenever I want and if I need to sacrifice a section of comedy in order to get the crowd back well then that's what I'm going to do I, I, I you know I didn't mind doing that so would I recommend to a person who didn't have the performance experience to do an hour? No, I would say go with half an hour and double up your bill with another comedian. I think that's 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 a common thing at Edinburgh, like comedians doing 25 minutes and they're on an hour long bill, a 50 minute bill, but they do 25 minutes and then another comedian does 25 minutes on the same show. I think that's the way, if I was to do it again, I would do it that way because one, you can, advertise with another person so you're doubling up on the amount of advertisement you do and two you have someone else there for those shows where it doesn't go right and you have someone else there for those shows where it goes right and so you can help each other out and i think that's an important thing in edinburgh because edinburgh can feel very lonely there's so many people there and there's so there's like 
over 3,000 shows starting. There's a show starting every 15 minutes for free. That's just in the free fringe alone. That's not even the paid gigs. So, so it's the, the competition is crazy, and everybody is kind of out for themselves in order to make the show their show as good as it can be. And it's not a. I don't. I never found this a very good place. Although all my performing mates are there, I just you just never get to see them because it's just so busy. So I think if I was performing with someone sharing the sharing the stage, I, that that would be a lot better. But in terms of actually writing, yeah, I, I just wrote. I, I spent I spent quite a while just writing as much as I can. As I said, I went with songs, and sometimes I would drag out the song just to kind of get, you know, um, more time out of a song. If it was going well, I would just continue on with it and do more jokes with it. And and if I felt that it was dipping, I would yeah go into performer mode and go back to the basics. As I always said, I'm, I'm a big one on the basics. Go back to talking. Go back to if I think if a performance is not going well for you, pretend to yourself like you've just walked back on the stage, like you've just walked out. Kind of stop what you're doing, and whatever whatever topic you're talking about, ask an audi- ask a member of the audience what they think. Um, and it doesn't matter what they say because whatever they say, you're going to steer the conversation into your next topic. So it's like if this topic isn't working, I can link a bridge from this topic way over to this topic over here. And how I get there isn't true the jokes that are no longer working for me. It's going to be true the audience who might be kind of getting bored. And what better way of of getting a bored person to perk up and pay more attention and get on board with what you're doing than simply directly talking to them? Now, obviously, you don't want to talk to a person who isn't paying attention, who doesn't know what you've said, but a person who has a smile on their face and someone who might be open to talking to you. So those little tricks, as you know, back to the basics was, was, was a big one for me at Edinburgh because yes, it's brutal. It's a whole month and you're performing. You only have one day off a week. And I was doing the street performing there as well. So it was 10 o'clock in the morning was a draw to see who got what show in one place. And then I would take my box, my show box down and I would do a straight back show. And then I was flyering, advertising my gig for an hour or two hours, and I get some food, and then I'd go to the venue, and then I would set up. And so I was on stage at a quarter past nine. So that's eleven hours after I got into town that day. And then the show was an hour, and then I would go back to where I was staying, and then back up the next day, and that whole thing for a month. And um, yeah, by week number two, your 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 all the shows are becoming the same, and it's it's tough. Like Edinburgh is, um, it's hard work. It's I I wouldn't call it fun. It's interesting. It's 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 a unique experience. Is it good for performers? I'm not. I'm not sure. It's very good for performers. I've seen I've seen Edinburgh be bad for performers because I've seen some performers come back from Edinburgh and treat every gig like it's a marathon race. They just have to get through it as quick as possible because they're conditioned because they're doing so much performing that, oh, I'm not even going to listen to the audience anymore. And I think that's, that's a, you know, we need like comedy. All performance is just communication. So you communicate your message, whatever you're doing to the audience, but you got to listen to what the audience is telling you. And I think Edinburgh does a lot of bad things. It gets comedians in bad habit of just thinking, oh, it's just another gig. Let's just get to the end of this because I got another gig later on tonight. And in Edinburgh, you can do so many gigs in one day that you know sometimes you can not pay attention to a gig in and be in the moment and then it will really hurt you when you have the ball and you can make a gig really great because you just don't notice you can make it great i talked to some slovenian colleagues who were at the uh leicester uh, festival of the fringe and uh glastonbury uh, not glastonbury sorry uh at the uh, edinburgh fringe as well and they, they were not like uh, hiring rooms they were doing those borscht and kind of uh, open free shows um, but they told me the philosophy of uh, Edinburgh Fringe Festival is to get noticed to swim up in this plethora of comedians and do a nation tour or even Australian tour or even uh, something else uh, did you have any plans after this disease stops now and the work stop uh, will continue in a different way but perhaps in a better way um, did you think of ever touring or you're just a london based comedian and that's it no i mean i've yeah i've done um 
I have done a lot of touring and I know I did a lot of touring with the band um, and I did a, I did a lot of touring was a street performer. Um, the the stand up comedy touring, it um, it's not something I'm I'm planning too much. And when I started a stand up, the reason I started it was more to, well, one I I I love it. Like I I think it's the, the, the performing stand up on stage is is a is a great rush because as i said before you don't have anything to hide behind you're either funny or you're not and so that's in that 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 thrill was exciting to me and then but but being a comedian full time it it's it's not as it's not as much of a calling to me as other other things are and like throughout lockdown I suppose throughout lockdown, I had a lot of time and what I've started to go back into is weirdly enough to music. I didn't think I was going to be going back into music, but I started going back to the music, got the guitar out. I'm just trying to learn at the moment all these pro these software programs about, you know, making music and writing songs and doing all that. And I'm finding a lot of joy through that at the moment. So and the street performing. The street performing always gave me the ability to travel and make a good living and i think i i make a lot more money off street performing than i would as a as a comedian and i also can perform a lot more and i can perform my own show and go to whatever town i want you know most mostly whatever town i want and so the stand up it's it's kind of like i chose street performing all those years ago had i chose stand up when i was in my early 20s and worked on that well, perhaps, maybe, if I was fortunate enough, then I would be saying the same thing about stand up now that I'm saying about street performing, that I would be able to earn the kind of living. But at this stage, I, I um, I'm not too hungry for a tour with stand up. Um, and to go back to the point you made about the Edinburgh thing, yes, it's true that a lot, a lot of comedians, um, do edinburgh to kind of rub shoulders with some of the more successful comedians but i think there's a i think people have i think people some people have, buy into the success edinburgh and other festivals can be for them i think especially edinburgh i think people are are better off doing other fringe festivals and getting a name of the smaller ones where it's easier and less people go but you can at least have some people coming to see your show like there are some uk and irish festivals that you will get a crowd whether edinburgh you might go many days without having more than six people watching you and like my my crowds were my crowds did range from i did a show for three four people and i did a show for 30 people so and they you would never know what you were going to get and it was hard to get people in the door whether you go to the smaller festivals you'll be just treated a lot better and you'll get better shows and i think that would that's a better way up that's a better like forget about rubbing shoulders with comedians because ultimately you need to be a good act like if if you're a really good act and you can you can really deliver well well then you're going to progress but if you're not a great act it doesn't matter who you know if you're not a great act and you're not able to get the job done when it's your moment on stage well you can know whoever you want to know but they're not going to do anything for you you know because their reputation's on the line too so i think that's I, i'm not i never really bought into that hype of networking and stuff i was always just about get the job done and if you can get it done to the absolute best of your ability and the majority you're never going to make everyone happy so the majority of people consistently time after time can leave feeling good about what you've done and then and they enjoy it more importantly whatever about your message but they actually enjoy it they have a good time well if you can do that and your focus is there rather than you know rather than telling your message your focus is on making them happy and you know making them making them happy that they chose to see you well then i think you're just going to progress anyway could we do like a parallel with music you you your group joined another group 
for the European uh, tour, it was Germany or Netherlands, something. I forgot there the exact few, country. Yeah. Uh, there was a few, but you get the opportunity to show the people your work, what you believe and what you do, and that's good. You don't probably you have this kind of bands, and you have the bands that do the the label stuff, and they're hot for one week, one month, or ten years, and they 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 die inside. Uh, is this is this uh, like something in your comedy thinking? Um, yeah, well, well, as I said uh, at the beginning, I always admired the success. If, if people like. I, I never really I never really cared if if people are only one hit wonders and they only have one song that was successful and they have to tour that song forever. Well, at least I got that song that was successful because it's it's tough. I mean, I I, I tried that I tried that with uh, the band. We had it. We were, you know we were an originals band. We we released three or four albums. We did. I well they're still going and they're called On Off and they're an excellent rock and roll band and they're living in L.A. So you can check them out. And uh, I was bass player with them for 11 years, as I said, from, from 2001 to 2012. And um, yeah, I mean, and that was that was that was fun. That was my first experience of, of, of performing. Um, I don't really have any. Yeah, I, I just think, well, you know, I just think any level of success is is great as long as it's success in a way that like, you know, the, the the work you're the work you're happy with putting out consistently is received well and you can just continue on doing that i think there's a difference there between wanting fame or like or being oh i'm like being this thing of wanting to be recognized all over the world because i i just think that's bullshit I, I don't think that's real for anyone i don't even think it's real for the people who appear to have it I think they can have it for, as you said, for just a few seconds. Even like even in comedy, even in comedy, you think of the biggest acts in the world, like you know Bill Burr and stuff, and Louis C.K. Louis C.K. is a perfect example. Who wants that life? It's, it's like who like it's 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 too big. It's too it's too successful. You do sooner or later, you do. I'm not commenting on anything in the past, but you do one thing wrong and it's it's like it it just shatters your entire career. Whether, you know, I've, I've been told this by, by a traveling group. I forget the name many years ago. They were saying I remember I was up and coming and they were saying to me how it's 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 better for you in the long run if you figure out how to be successful just under the level of TV, because, <laughs> of course, yes, a lot of people want to get on TV and that's and that's great. But there, there comes a huge price at that, and there comes a lot more sacrifices the higher up you go. And this thing about this, it's a young it's a young person's thing. This thing of wanting fame, but I don't really believe any of them would want the life of a of a legitimately famous person because it's brutal. It's you're just traveling. You're just traveling all the time. If if you're that if you're that successful, it's it's it just never stops. You have interview after interview. You're doing five or six interviews a day, and then you got to do the tour. And so you're never whatever home is. You're never there. And so you might have all the money in the world, but you're just you're just a you're just a product at that stage. So I, I was never really interested in that. Um, I never really understood that. Do they want to, you know, so I shoot for as good as I can be. And yeah, I want to progress in the career. But this thing about this dreamland thing that people seem to have that's not connected to anyone's reality, that I, you know, I don't, I just don't really understand that. Um, because in the end of the day, I, I just found more joy to go back and figure out the basics of something I don't understand and put it out in the world and see if people respond well to it. And if I can make it, living out of it then then that's all i need great great it's not all about fame and uh, i don't know tv and stuff about like that it's about excellence so being good at something that's that's what drives i don't know how many people but uh and there, there there's the then there then there's your youtube channel where you do free lessons and people from 
all around the world can hear you because you have your special voice. I don't mean like your Irish accent, but how you present and how you educate people and you drive the whole world together without even leaving your uh, facilities. Uh, or how, yeah. right? That's uh, it, yeah. The, do you do you enjoy this uh, educational aspect as well? You said you did some workshops uh, before the lockdown, but uh, do you enjoy? It? I don't know. It is is it is it the metric? I have a younger friend who's all about the likes, the views, and everything. I don't give a shit about that because it's the content that's good that interests me. How about you? What does your YouTube channel do for you? Yeah, that that that's. Yeah, I, um, yet again, it was. But first of all, yes, I I love it. I I, I do. Um, it's the more the bigger it gets, the more people who subscribe, and the more episodes I do, I find the more work I put into each video. Certainly, when it comes to a writing, because um, there was a few times in a video where okay, I have an idea and. I just sit in front of the camera and I'll speak for maybe over an hour and I'll edit a 20 minute video with, with the, with what I think is the best information I've given. And now when I want to create a video, I just, I don't know, maybe because more people are listening now and more people are subscribing all the time. But I feel that I need to do them as much justice as possible. And my, maybe I'm making it too hard on myself, but I, but I am finding the workload to be getting more and more each time. It's not something that that, that I just find find easy um, just to throw out there. It's it's it's. I feel after I've recorded an episode that I've kind of done a big show or something. Like I, I kind of come off like wow. But um, I do I do really enjoy it. Um, and as I said, I'm the likes and all that. I think I would be lying if I said. Like if I put out the first few videos and nobody watched them, I don't think I would be still doing it because I said, as I said, I was looking for a way to be productive and busy through lockdown. And at the time I was doing a lot. I was learning the video editing and I was studying event management. And I was, these are all just things I was doing on my own just as a hobby. I was studying the social media side of things. And when lockdown happened, I really didn't know well, I didn't know how long it was going to be for. I didn't know what my future was going to be about. So I was like, right, well, let's get learning as many things as possible. So when anything opens up, I can offer some form of service. And the YouTube was something I put out there. If nobody liked it, I was it was taking up too much of my time to keep going. So the fact that people liked it and their views came in and people started to subscribe meant that, okay, well, they want to hear what I have to say. So therefore, I will continue with it. And and then, yeah, so I, I did want it to be successful. Did I did I work to share it everywhere? No, I didn't. I didn't really promote it. I didn't I didn't make my friends like the page, that type of thing. I kind of kept it quiet and and just checked out if the comedians I'm connected to in London were liked it. And then they did. And then very pretty quickly, actually, you know, people around the world started to respond in a positive way to it. And although it's it's still small, it has gained over a thousand subscribers in six months, which I'm just, that's, that's you know, I would be happy with half that. That was my, my goal when I set, I set up in August. I was thinking if I get a thousand in a year, I'll be very, very happy with that. And so it's got a thousand in six months and I'm like, I'm very, very happy with that. So I'm definitely going to continue it. I'm, you know, I got, endless amount of videos i'm not running short of any ideas i think i have i think i've got 120 titles written out that have yet to be made and you know i also find the videos change too as i start to talk like i'll have an idea for what i want to talk about and then halfway through the just letting myself talk and looking at my notes that i'll realize oh there's a better message I can be telling them here. And so the I always make sure to write the title of the video and a description I make at the beginning. I kind of do it backwards. I make the description in the intro at the very, very end, just in case I come up with a better idea as I'm talking and oh this is what I'm this is what this video is going to be about. 
And then so maybe I'll take one video and cut it into two and it'll be two videos because if I go off point, I'll, I'll want to make both points be meaningful. So the process, I, I really like the process. Um, and as we spoke about earlier on, I live on a boat. I think that's that's the only obstacle that's always changing because you can see the background here isn't the best and I have to always um, move things around and there's a lot of work involved in just setting up the camera and setting up the background and, and, and getting things so that I can record. I don't have a space so I can just go. So that's, those things are, you know, and sometimes because I'm on a boat, if it's in the daytime, there's a lot of noise outside, people hanging around, walking by, and I can't record then because it's too loud. It'll be picked up on the microphone. If it rains, the rain on top of the boat will be heard on the microphone. So there's all these conditions that when I record, everything needs to be perfect, and that might take some time. So there, the you know that adds to the workload. Ultimately, yes, I'm really enjoying it. I'm delighted people are responding well to what I have to say, and I like as well the fact that I'm giving people maybe a connection to what they love to do when they can't do it, which is nice because it's certainly helped me out. It's helped me. I think the YouTube has helped me stay connected to something I love during a time when it wasn't accessible to me, which I never thought was going to happen ever. I always thought there'd be some stage to perform on. And so a crazy time, eh? And so that it's been it's been lovely to me to be able to connect to people, uh, even if it is through YouTube. And I also love YouTube. I, I I love the platform myself. I think it's fantastic to have. I mean, rather than guitar teachers, you can legitimately look at the person who wrote the song you want to play, talking about how they wrote it, and and to have that insight. Whoever, whatever musician or magician or comedian or you can pretty much look up interviews of of their own thoughts on what they do and what a, what kind of an amazing platform is that so and i was a fan of you know i looked up my my competitors i would say although i don't i don't view them as that at all i looked up the other comedy channels and you know there's some great comedy tutorial channels dedicated just to comedy and um so i wanted to make sure i was doing something different than them they 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 speak a lot about uh, writing, and I think I've got less videos on writing comedy than I do on performance, because I, I would argue sometimes the performance, I'm not going to say it's more important, but sometimes I feel people overlook the performance, and they just think, well, if my jokes are good at writing, then I should be good on stage, and I think that's a shame. I think that's, um, that's creating a lot of, of good writers but a lot of deadpan style acts that haven't thought about how they present themselves. And the reason I want to talk about performance and about communication and about how you present yourself is because I know I'm aware I'm talking to a lot of people who might not be, who might not turn into professional comedians and who might not want to turn into professional comedians. They just want to develop as a comic for a period of the time and experience that. But I think there's a lot to learn of about how to go about your life to be a better person through performing well because communication is everything if you can communicate well you can do business deals you can meet people easier you can you'll be able to gain more confidence a lot easier if you know you can communicate in a, you know in a situation and if you know you can read a room in a situation you know at a party how to conduct yourself in the best way possible. I think there's a lot of life lessons to be learned from learning how to go 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 down well in a basic five minute set or a ten minute set. So yeah. So and and that's another thing I would love to offer uh, through the yeah through YouTube and yeah keep it all for free. Why not? Well, uh, the best things are free. Uh, why yeah. not? Why not? Why not sharing your knowledge? Uh, it enhances your knowledge because you you have to distill your thoughts, as you said yourself that you 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 prepare some topic and then you find oh I want it, I can say this here and I'm gonna split it up and uh, I think that's perfect that's perfect I'm quite interesting in the comedians who start who starting uh, stand up now in the quarantine times. Uh, since uh, when you first uh, step on the stage, it's quite a different feeling, and uh, it's very oh, rewarding, yeah. of course. And, um, and it's tough because when you... I was when I was asked people, 
people are obviously, you know, people ask us all the time, what, you know, what, what advice would you give? I'm sure you get it all the time. What advice would you give new comedians? And before lockdown, I would just say, like, well, I've already said before, be likable. Just focus on being likable. The laughs will come after. Like, go up on stage with the jokes you write, but do it in a way that's likable. Because a lot of the times I think people are trying to copy successful comedians. Certainly, I, I, I always say Bill Burr. I see so many young young people trying to copy exactly what Bill Burr does and not realize that he actually has charisma between his insults. He wins them over first. And so that's number one, be likable. But I think number two is don't listen to anyone until you get to gig number 50 or maybe even gig number 100 and keep getting on stage. Just look at the next gig. Think about like, think about it in the terms of like, you know, the more you do something, well, the better you're going to be. It's like, it's, it's some, for some reason, people think that they're a finished you know, new like amateur com comedians think they're a finished product after like their fifth gig or something. And it's like, but you can't do anything after your fifth time doing it. If you picked up a guitar for five times, you can't even still play a song. If you picked up three juggling balls five times, the chances of you being able to get 10 catches are pretty minimum. So you're just such a, all you are is um, um, potential. It's just potential at the beginning until you get to gig number 100. And then you can listen to people when you get to gig the, your appearance number 100 on stage because then you'll be able to understand what it is they're talking to you about in the ways that make you better. And at gig number 100, you can listen to them or you can tell them to fuck off. Either way, you have your opinions and you have your reasonings to be the way you are. But before then, you know, don't ask anyone, you know, like uh, listen in whatever way you want to listen and 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 you know but if someone tells you oh you shouldn't do this joke or you should do it this way that's why i'm not so much about the writing because the writing is so personal and you know and i also believe a bad joke can be made funny with a good performance um but i think if you're a bad performer a lot of great jokes are going to be lost because your timing is off and your the way you hold a mic and the way you move on the stage or you might be paid you know the amount of times i've seen great like good writers but they're walking across the stage so fast that you, you know you're, you're, you're like this <laughs> and then so you're not listening to anything that's going on or else they just look like this they look at their feet and they mutter the line and i might hear the line going that's actually really funny but you just didn't present it. You didn't perform it. So it's, it's not all of, you know, I, I would say it's them. It's not all about, you know, not all about the writing. I was, you know, you should continuously do the writing and it should be a part of your expression. But I think um, when you're on stage, you should be really paying attention and communicating. It's, it's you're, you're telling them something, but are they actually listening? Do they have smiles on faces? Are they upright in their seat? Are they happy that you're on stage? All those questions, like what section of the room is closed off to you that you might need want to open up? And there's ways of doing that, like putting your attention on someone who's enjoying what you're doing and then getting the warmth, getting the vibe of why they're enjoying it and then simply shifting your focus to someone who might not be enjoying what you're doing and you're kind of sharing the sharing the enjoyment i mean you can even be real bold with it and say and talk to the person who's liking it and then talk to the person who's not liking it and see if you can bring over some of the positive energy so there's all these kind of interesting yet quite basic ways of playing with it and um we spoke earlier on about about her learning i didn't read the comedy books but i certainly read the behavioral books and i read books on body language and i learned and i read a lot of books in communication and I think that that helped me through the years, too. I'm, and I'm continuously reading those types of books, too. Um, how, you know, body, you know, how body language plays a part in what we, you know, in our communication and the words in which we use to, to to engage with certain people, depending on how they are, they want to be seen. You know, there's, there's, there's a lot of there's all different ways of playing it. Like if you're doing a corporate gig for, you know, people who work in finance, you're going to communicate to them in a different way than you're going to communicate to a student gig, maybe at a college. So there's obviously, now that's an extreme example, but people are, 
there's there's smaller examples there too as well and that that's interesting to me perfect perfect advice perfect advice uh the only thing i think needs clarification is you mentioned bill burr a couple of times he does his podcasts sometimes even twice weekly where he's talking into a microphone for a prolonged time he probably his way of writing is different it's not just insults it's jokes 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 and uh if in our country now it's time for skiing if you go for skiing once a year you're not gonna improve as a skier you have to be methodical go a couple of times and always correct one small detail that uh, is hindrance to bettering yourself and it's the same with comedy you, you should do 50 and 100 gigs of course but always think of what you you could uh, manage like a bit be- a little bit better or absolutely did did you ever get the advice that was like a total opposite to what you were not like just uh, small corrections but like 180 uh put on a tutu and dance <laughs> um i've got some yeah i've got some people um uh yeah telling me weird things over the years i think one i think when i came to Covent garden when i moved to london a person, uh, a mate of mine who was performing long, long, long time, he told me to take, you know, this was my street show. It wasn't my stand-up. It was my street show. He said, because I was having a, at the time, I was having a weird time with the jokes. I, I felt that I was going through a small period of time where the jokes weren't hitting the way they used to. And I was having a hard time figuring out why that was. And, of course, you go through moments like this sometimes you know but this particular time i was like i'm not figuring out why i'm not getting the laughs that i'm used to in the same space doing the same show i'm like all of a sudden and he's he said take out all the jokes so just do the straight jacket just don't do any jokes and then do that like two or three times in a show now as i said you can't really do that in stand up you got to do the jokes but in the street you can just do an interesting show and get the person. And of course, there was still some laughs because when I took out all the jokes that I prepared, well, now I'm just talking naturally. And there was moments where I'm going to say something and I got a, you know, I got a headset mic on. So everything I say is truly amplifier and everyone can hear it. So it's all good. And so the joke, I became just, I was just chatting. And I was talking and I brought the volunteer in, they got all tied up and the chain. And as I'm going on, I'm just talking. And every now and then I'm hitting on something good. So it's like I'm kind of redoing a show. It's like I'm recreating a show I know works all over again. So I kept the parts with all the moves and they escaped. And then I started to put the jokes in again. But I only put ones in that I knew I was going to get a good reaction with. And so what that meant was a month later, I only had the jokes that worked and my show got way stronger. So yes, I might have suffered a little bit over, you know, over those over those over that few months that those few weeks where I was messing around and taking jokes out and yes, there might have been moments in my show where I wasn't sure what the patter I was saying was was going and there might have been some confusion, but ultimately because of what I was doing was working. So how can I equal that to a person who's going on stage. Well, I would say maybe if you're going through a section where you're going through a position where your jokes aren't getting as much laughs as they used to be, I would I would think your transitions and how you're getting from one joke to another are getting too complicated. There's not an obvious connection there. I think there's somewhere along the way you're losing people. And sometimes when we start to get we, we do a routine for the first time and we're nervous and we're paying so much attention to every single word that comes out of our mouth because we're trying to remember it for the first time and present it on stage. And then we go to, and that, and that sometimes doesn't, that's not necessarily the funniest time we do it because we're only learning how to say it on stage. Then we learn how to say it on stage and that's when the audience start to respond in the way we want. So if they respond really good, we go, great. I finally found out, I finally wrote the piece, I found out how to say it, and the crowd are beginning to respond in the way I want to it. Great, I know a solid piece. But then we get comfortable. And then we start to forget about what made that piece great. And if we do loads of gigs, and as you said earlier on, if you don't take away something from each gig and go, okay, what worked in that gig? 
not just about writing down what you're going to say, but you should take your note back, out, notepad out when you get home and write down what worked, what didn't work, why did it work, why did it not work, and what you can take from the gig. If you stop doing that, I found in my in my career, sometimes I've stopped doing that, stopped because you have a, you have a lot of gigs coming up, and it's it's you just it's your job now, and you're getting a bit of paid, and you're worrying about bills, and there's a lot of other things going on. And then if you really look at exactly what it is you're doing on stage, you you'll probably realize that somewhere along the line, your the communication you're telling the audience is very complicated. Like you might think it's not because you understand this, but you've got so used to telling the bit that perhaps the setup you've taken it out without even noticing or there's something missing, or maybe you're adding something in that's not needed and you're giving the audience too much to think about before getting to the actual punchline. So lots, 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 of, um, lots of ideas there. Great, great. And I uh, just wanted to mention for young comedians, uh, this is a recording device as well. You can record your shows and review them afterwards. Who would have thought? Who would yes. have thought? Always record um, your show. Record every show you do. That's so important. Record every time you're on stage never think oh i'm just going to go up and not record this time because that's probably going to be one of your best performances the amount of times i haven't recorded and i perform so well and they go oh god i didn't have that recorded and then you bring the recording equipment to the next gig and die on your arse exactly exactly uh gary thank you very much uh i know you have uh, some plans for to tonight uh i would like to thank you uh, for your time and uh next time perhaps in a half a year or something i call you and we're gonna make a live event so people can Lovely. join in and with the questions and suggestions uh that thank you lovely. again thank you so uh, much for having uh, me on of course, everybody from Slovenia, check him out and subscribe and do some likes and comments on Let's Talk Comedy. All the links are going to be in the description and this pop-ups YouTube uh, cards. Huh? And uh, thank you again, man. Uh, have, a, have a great evening. Bye. Thank you so much. See you.